Welcome to episode number 17 of our Strangest Unsolved National Park Disappearances series, where we present 10 more cases for you to ponder. In the United States National Park System alone, there are more than 84 million acres of preserved woods, deserts, mountains, and other wilderness. So it's no surprise that in the past 100 years, there have been a number of cases of reported missing persons. But what's most disturbing is these numbers are increasing at an alarming rate, and the circumstances behind these disappearances can sometimes be beyond bizarre. Today, we'll discuss 10 more unsolved National Park disappearances. Please note, some of these cases have very limited information, but we will do our best to keep you updated of any new developments in future episodes. With that, sit back, get comfortable, and let's begin. Number 10, Ronan Lawler. In the months before his disappearance, 28-year-old Ronan Lawler had quit his job in Bellina, County Mayo, Ireland, and had poured all of his money and resources into traveling. After graduating from University College in Dublin and getting himself an engineering job, Ronan discovered that he wanted more from life and had begun to make plans to backpack around South America. Now, it's common in the UK and Ireland for young people to backpack around South America and other places, and you'll find numerous blogs, YouTube channels, and Instagram pages of young people who are doing just the same as Ronan did. The only difference is that these young people make it home. Ronan had planned to backpack for around eight months, and by November 18, 2007, he had made it to Argentina. According to the Irish Times newspaper, Ronan entered the Torres del Paine National Park situated on the Argentine-Chilean border on November 18th, and sadly, this was the last time he was ever heard from. According to the Irish Times, Ronan kept a travel blog, and those who knew him kept up with his post, eagerly awaiting the next set of photos and stories from his trip. The last entry was made on November 17th, 2007, and the last communication from Ronan came on November 18th when he sent a text to his friend, Bernard McCabe. After that, Ronan vanished into thin air and failed to make contact with his friends or family. His family noted straight away that this was extremely out of character for Ronan, as he called and messaged his family at least once a week during his trip. Their suspicions were confirmed when Ronan failed to show up for his flight to Buenos Aires on November 25, 2007. After this, Ronan was reported missing and the search and rescue effort began. Helicopters from the Chilean Army, Scent dogs and searchers on the ground combed through the park, looking for any sign of Ronan. However, as the days passed, there was no sign of Ronan to be found. His family, understandably devastated, flew out to Argentina from Ireland to help in the search effort for Ronan, and in mid-December 2007, another break in the case came. As reported by the Irish Times, Ronan's backpack was found at a hostel in El Cafate, Argentina, around 159 miles away from the National Park, per Google. Ronan was entering the park at the border of Chile and Argentina, so the distance may be closer. However, the two places are still significantly far apart, no matter where Ronan entered the park. The contents of his backpack have not been released, but his family hoped and prayed that this was a positive sign. Christmas 2007 came and went, and the Lawler family ushered in the new year without their beloved Ronan. Then, just a few days after the New Year's celebrations had died down, a horrific discovery was made. Two Brazilian mountaineers, making their way through the park, discovered Ronan's body in a crevice and reported this to the police. The Chilean authorities responded immediately and were flooded with questions as to whether this was the body of missing hiker Ronan Lawler. By the end of January, the Chilean authorities had indeed confirmed that the body discovered in the crevice was that of 28-year-old Ronan Lawler and that his family had been made aware of his discovery. According to a report by The Independent, in January 2008, it is believed that he had fallen after losing his footing while hiking on his own. Ronan's body was recovered and transported back to Ireland so that his family could give him a proper burial and a full service. The news rocked the people in County Mayo and the area where Ronan had grown up. Ronan was described as an intelligent young man with the whole world ahead of him. His father told the Independent that it was a joyous day when they learned that their son had been found and that they finally had closure. He went on to say, The discovery of Ronan's body has been a blessing to us. The day the news of the discovery came through was a joyous day for all of us. Up until this, 
we had been resigned to the fact that Ronan might never be found. This would have made it very difficult to bring about any sense of closure for us. Now we have finality, and after many very difficult months, it's just nice to have him home at last. Rest in peace, Ronan, and prayers to the family. Number 9. John Young Wan There are very few details in the case of John Young Wan, and one Redditor believes that they may have discovered a vital clue in his disappearance. According to the National Park Service, John Young's white Toyota Camry was found on the south rim of the Grand Canyon National Park on September 17, 2017. The car had been abandoned, and there was no sign of Zhang Yun. This discovery puzzled investigators, who decided to dig a little deeper, and they found that, according to his friends and family, Zhang Yun had no plans to be in the Grand Canyon National Park at all. Investigators also found that his car had been seen near the New Hans Trailhead, but nobody could confirm if Zhang Yun was in or around the car. Zhang Yun has not been seen or heard from since, and the authorities are concerned for his welfare. There are very few articles online documenting his disappearance, but one post to the r slash Unsolved Mysteries subreddit caught our eye. A user by the name of u slash Maya underscore Minamito wrote a post about Zhang Yun's case in 2020. They added the following update to their post that reads, Update. Found Zhang Yun Wan's second Facebook page in Korean, and his first name isn't Zhang Yun anymore, it's Daniel now. He also has more friends. Well, there are five. Should I send them a message? What do you think? Maybe they are from the same family. No further updates were added to this post, but this does bring about the question of whether Zhang Yun wanted to disappear or whether this is merely just a coincidence, someone with the same name. Zhang Yun Wan is described as an Asian male with black hair, brown eyes, stands 5 foot 7 inches tall and weighs 121 pounds. His car was found abandoned in the Grand Canyon National Park, and authorities are concerned for his welfare. Anyone with any information is asked to contact the National Park Service at 888-653-0009. Number 8. Adam Clayton Lyle Jones 23-year-old Adam Clayton Lyle Jones was last seen on March 31, 2011 in Gulf Breeze, Florida, by his family, who had no idea what was about to unfold in front of them. Armed with only his laptop and his debit card, Adam jumped into his light blue Oldsmobile Delta 88 with a dark blue vinyl top and no hubcaps and headed out west. His family thought he was going for a simple road trip, but a discovery a few days later would change all of that. His family had no idea that Adam was even missing or in danger. He didn't own a cell phone and had appeared fine when he set off west from Gulf Breeze, Florida. It wasn't until the family received a call on May 5, 2011, that they realized the gravity of the situation. The call was from a park ranger, informing them that Adam's car had been found, abandoned, at the South Rim Visitor Center in the Grand Canyon National Park, over 1,690 miles away from his home. Following this discovery, Adam was reported missing, and a wide-scale search began. Bank records showed that in the days before his disappearance, Adam had used his debit card in Louisiana and Texas. Inside his abandoned car, they also found an itinerary that would have taken him through California and Denver, Colorado. The itinerary provided no further clues and does not appear as though Adam's card has been used since his disappearance. Authorities have not shared any other details about Adam's car, and we don't know what happened to the laptop. Unfortunately, there are very few details to work with, which is both frustrating and heartbreaking. His family members shared several posts on Facebook asking for anyone with information to please come forward. However, over 10 years later, we are still searching for the truth. Adam Clayton Lyle Jones is described as a white male with brown hair and blue eyes, stands 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighs 145 pounds. He was last seen driving a light blue Oldsmobile Delta 88 with Florida license plates, no hubcaps with a dark blue vinyl top. This car was later located in the Grand Canyon National Park. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office at 850-983-1162 or the Grand Canyon National Park Service at 928-638-7805. Number 7. Armin B. Johnson 
44-year-old Armin B. Johnson always tried to do good for others. He worked as a therapeutic aide for children with autism, and in his spare time, he volunteered at the local high school, which was in Hilo, Hawaii. He coached kids through their physical education lessons and activities. He was well regarded in the community, known as a kind and thoughtful man who would offer out the branch of help to anyone who needed it. While he wasn't native to Hawaii, he had quickly been accepted by the local community and had fit in well following his move from Seattle. When not helping out the local community and his children, Armin also hosted a reggae radio show and was also a big figure in local ministries. By all accounts, Armin was a kind and loving man who had a big heart and a man who was very well known in his community of Hilo. He had a magnetic personality, was charming, and seemed to put everyone who met him at ease. Unfortunately, things for Armin would take a tragic turn in April 2005, and ever since then, the Hawaiian authorities and the FBI have been on the hunt for the person responsible. On April 13, 2005, a passerby found Armin's body near mile marker 71 on Mamalahoa Highway on the southern edge of the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Wearing only a tank top, swimming shorts, socks, and slippers, Armin had been shot where he stood, once in the back of his neck before his attacker fled. There is no mention of what evidence, if any, was obtained from the scene and whether this has ever been processed for DNA. There are lots of unknowns in Armin's case, and now, over 17 years later, the FBI are still desperately trying to track down the person responsible. The news of Armin's passing shocked the community. He was well-loved for his kind and gentle nature, and everyone struggled to think who would want to do such a thing to him. Unfortunately, there is little information available about the case, aside from the facts that have already been presented here. As we said, Armin was a well-liked man in the community, and his passing has shocked community members and the FBI. A friend of Armin's, Bill Stormont, said, He talked in a loud voice. You could hear him across the room. He wasn't aggressive, though. To put it bluntly, he couldn't fight his way out of a paper sack. There's currently a $10,000 reward for any information that leads to an arrest in Armin's case, and anyone with any information is asked to please contact the FBI's Honolulu branch office at 808-566-4300. Armin, rest in peace, and I hope justice is served. Number 6. Kieran Burke 44-year-old Irish citizen Kieran Burke was last seen on April 5, 2000 in the Yosemite Valley in Curry Village in the Yosemite National Park. Kieran had spent his life in County Dublin, Ireland, where he was surrounded by stunning scenery and large open spaces. As a result, Kieran became an expert hiker and outdoorsman, and in 2000, he decided to take the trip of a lifetime to San Francisco, California. According to reports, Kieran planned on spending two weeks in the U.S. before returning home to share his adventures with his family. Kieran boarded the plane from Dublin to California with his family waving him off as he went, not knowing that this would be the last time that they would see him. Within a matter of weeks, however, they too would be boarding a plane to America to help search and rescue teams find him. On April 11, 2000, the Yosemite National Park staff contacted authorities let them know that Kieran had not checked out of the park on April 6th, as he had stated in his plans. After this report came in, authorities went to the campsite and found that Kieran's tent was still in place with everything inside. This immediately struck investigators as odd, and they began their search for him. During their initial investigation, they spoke to witnesses who recalled seeing Kieran in the Yosemite Valley at Curry Village while he was on a day hike. This is the last confirmed sighting of Kieran, and after this, it seemed as if he simply vanished. A wide-scale search of the park was conducted after Kieran was reported missing. However, these searches yielded no results. His family even flew over from Ireland to Yosemite National Park to aid in the searches. But now, over 22 years later, his disappearance remains a mystery. Kieran Burke is described as a white male with black hair, blue eyes, standing 6 feet tall and 180 pounds. He was last seen wearing a leather bomber jacket, and his rental car was discovered in the parking lot of Curry Village. Authorities also believe that he may have been carrying his camera at the time he went missing. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Yosemite National Park Service at 209-372-0361 and reference case number NP-19008909. Numbers 5 and 4. 
Julianne Williams, and Laura Winans. This next case is two entries rolled into one as we dive into the mystery of Julianne Williams and Laura Winans. These two bright young women, unfortunately, met their end in the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia, and almost 26 years later, their cases remain unsolved. Julianne and Laura were from different worlds. Laura, who went by Lolly, had an affluent upbringing, but as she got older, she decided to reject the privilege she had around her in search of a more down-to-earth life. Julianne, who went by Julie, had had a rather standard working-class upbringing, and to outsiders, it seemed unlikely that the worlds of these two women would collide. However, in 1994, the two crossed paths while working with the charity Woods Women, based in Minnesota, which helps women get into outdoor activities by providing them with the equipment and knowledge to do so. Both Lolly and Julie loved hiking, and they quickly bonded over their shared interests. The two quickly became a couple and appeared to be very happy and content together. Despite coming from two different worlds, the girls did share another thing in common aside from their love of the outdoors. They both liked to help others. Lolly liked to help others in the outdoors, while Julie also liked to help others in a different setting. When not out hiking, Julie would often devote her time to working with those less fortunate in the community, and the couple were liked by all who met them. On May 19, 1996, the couple set out on what would be their last trip. Julie had recently gotten herself a new job, and the two women wanted to spend the last of their free time together in the great outdoors. On May 19, 1996, Julie and Lolly packed their bags, gathered supplies, and most importantly, brought along another companion, Lolly's dog, Taj. The three said their goodbyes and headed for the Shenandoah National Park. The two women told their parents that they would be home by May 28th, which gave Julie time to prepare for her new job. The two women entered the park on May 19th, 1996, and unfortunately, that was the last time they were ever seen or heard from. By May 28th, 1996, Neither of the girls' parents had heard from them, which deeply concerned the parents. Both women were known to be responsible, and it was out of character for them not to have made contact. Thomas Williams, Julie's dad, knew that something wasn't quite right, and by May 31st, just a day before his daughter was set to start her new job, he reported the duo missing. Thomas hoped and prayed that the two women had simply lost track of time and would be found wandering in the park. However... What investigators would find next shocked the Williams and the Winans to their core. On June 1st, 1996, the day that Julie was due to start her new job that she was so excited about, investigators would make a horrific discovery. Just north of the Skyland Lodge near the Bridal Trail, the car and the bodies of Julie and Lolly were discovered. The area surrounding where the women were found had been busy over the weekend, but their bodies had remained undiscovered. Both women had suffered being tied up before being undressed and attacked. The exact details of what Lolly and Julie went through are too graphic to share here, unfortunately, and are unimaginable, to say the least. The discovery quickly pivoted the investigation from missing persons to a murder inquiry. Their families were made aware of the discovery, and just like that, within a matter of moments, the lives of two families had been shattered. The Shenandoah National Park is under federal jurisdiction, the FBI, the National Park Service, and the Virginia State Police all worked together to help solve the case. No male DNA evidence was found at the crime scene, and the authorities quickly found themselves at a dead end with the case. That was until a person of interest, Daryl David Rice, entered the picture. Rice had been arrested for attacking and trying to abduct Canadian cyclist Yvonne Malbasha in the same park in 1997. The authorities quickly began to establish links between Rice and the crime against Lolly and Julie, and according to sources, Rice was known to be very anti-LGBTQ+, and it was theorized that this was perhaps his motive for killing the two women. After gathering evidence and testimony, Rice was taken to trial, but he was not charged. The prosecution failed to submit adequate forensic evidence that proved Rice was responsible, and he was able to dodge the double murder charge. Rice was found guilty of attempting to kidnap Canadian Yvonne Malbasha, for which he was sentenced to 11 years in prison. He had also been the subject of several other investigations for similar crimes and has been outed as a woman hater and a homophobe. He regularly told others that women were more vulnerable than men and that Julie and Lolly deserved what happened to them because they were gay. 
After the Julian Lolly case was dismissed against Rice in 2004, the case has remained cold ever since. Although, while we might view the case as cold, the FBI certainly doesn't see it that way. Adam Lee, the special agent in charge of the FBI Richmond Division, told NBC Washington in June 2016, This is a pending case, and I bristle at the term cold case. We will stop at nothing to find justice in the case, and until we have exhausted every means, we continue to this day to exploit the existing evidence and to try to obtain new evidence. Julie and Lolly are not forgotten in the Richmond Division of the FBI, and we are going to aggressively pursue every lead in this case. The parents of Lolly and Julie hold out hope that one day their daughter's cases will be solved. The two women were in a loving relationship, and both of them had bright, promising futures ahead. While the FBI and other authorities are looking down other avenues for answers, Thomas Williams, the father of Julie, believes that Rice is the one responsible. He spoke to NBC Washington in June 2016 and said, I think that certainly, on the very remote possibility that it could be anybody else, we would look forward to having justice with Julie. Anyone with any information about the murders of Julie Williams and Lolly Winans is asked to please contact the FBI's Richmond office at 804 804- 261-1044 or you can contact the Shenandoah National Park Service at 540-999-3500 Julie and Lolly rest in peace our hearts and prayers go out to the families number three Dan Campbell Tracy Erb was excited to meet her boyfriend, 41-year-old Dan Campbell, in the Jardine area just outside of Yellowstone National Park on April 6, 1991. The two resided in Sweetgrass County, Montana, and were looking ahead to the future together. Two days earlier, on April 4th, Dan had headed into the park with his trusty canine companion in search of elk antlers. The gathering and selling of elk antlers is illegal, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Yellowstone National Park is no stranger to those gathering elk antlers, and just because it's illegal doesn't mean people won't try to do it anyway. From reports, we know that Dan entered the Yellowstone National Park on April 4, 1991, after being dropped off at the Hell Roaring Creek Trailhead. This was the last time that Dan was ever seen or heard from, and as previously mentioned, when he failed to turn up and meet his girlfriend, the alarm was raised. On April 8, 1991, Dan was officially reported missing and the search and rescue effort for him commenced. According to sources, Dan left with minimal equipment as he did not plan on being in the park for long, and as the weather changed and thunderstorms rolled in, the concern for his safety and welfare rose. While he was an experienced outdoorsman and had extensive knowledge in pole cutting, without the proper equipment and clothing, Dan stood little chance against the elements. The search effort continued for Dan, although his family has commented that this search was lackluster and disappointing. During their search, authorities failed to uncover any sign of Dan or his Australian Shepherd dog, which led his family to believe that he had met with foul play. In the months after his disappearance, Dan's brother, Billy Campbell, told the Helena Independent Record he had been running with some pretty shady characters. I'm not saying he's an angel, because he's not. His younger brother, Rod Campbell, further went on to tell the news, July of 1991, If Dan's in the park, he's buried. I don't think Dan is alive. How that demise came, well, I've got a lot of mixed emotions about it. Authorities and his family denied rumors that Dan had run away to start a new life, stating that he was about to come into a large sum of money and he had plans to use that money and the money he made from selling elk antlers to move house. With few updates in Dan's case, his family quickly became frustrated with law enforcement and in February 2000, they filed a federal lawsuit against the Park County Sheriff at the time, Charlie Johnson. According to news reports, the lawsuit stated that Sheriff Johnson breached his legal duty to properly and competently conduct the investigation relating to the disappearance of Dan Campbell. It was also during this time that Dan's family divulged more information about his disappearance. In an article for the Independent Record, Billy Campbell said, From the evidence I've acquired down through the years, I believe my brother was murdered there. There were 14 people up there horn hunting in the area at that time. Another horn hunter up there heard two shots. Now, we will point out here that these claims have never been substantiated, but it is clear that Dan's family were not happy with the level of investigation that was conducted into his disappearance. As of this recording in 2022, 
No sign of Dan nor his dog has ever been found, and his case remains cold. Dan Campbell is described as a white male with brown hair and green eyes, stands 5 foot 7 inches tall, and weighs 130 pounds. Dan had a healed fracture to his left hand, a scar on his chin, a scar on his upper right arm, and a gap between his front teeth. Anyone with information is asked to please contact Sheriff Dan Tronrud of the Sweetgrass County Sheriff's Office at 406-932-5143 and mention case number 91-60. Or you can call Sheriff Scott Hamilton of the Park County Sheriff's Office at 406-222-2050. Number two, David Paul Morrison. 28-year-old David Paul Morrison was last seen in the Little Yosemite Valley in the Yosemite National Park on May 25, 1998. According to reports, David had planned on hiking from Little Yosemite Valley to Half Dome, but when he never arrived, his friends and family grew concerned. Witnesses placed David in Little Yosemite Valley at around 7.15 a.m. and it's believed that he set off on his hike shortly thereafter. Sadly, not much is known about David or his life, and the only reminder of his existence is through missing persons posters and pages. The Charlie Project notes that although David was an experienced hiker, he wasn't carrying the necessary supplies to be gone overnight or for any extended period of time for that matter. This is the only information available about his disappearance, and the Yosemite National Park Service is appealing to anyone with any information to please come forward. David Paul Morrison was last seen on the morning of May 15, 1998, in Little Yosemite Valley in the Yosemite National Park. He is described as a white male with brown hair, brown eyes, standing 5 foot 9 inches tall and weighing 150 pounds. David had a birthmark on his right earlobe and a scar on the bridge of his nose. He was last seen wearing a gray, long-sleeved University of California jacket, a white t-shirt, black tracksuit bottoms or perhaps faded navy shorts, Nike Air Trainers, and a black, green, and yellow fanny pack. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Yosemite National Park Service at 209-372-0361. And lastly, number one, Tim Barnes. 24-year-old Timothy Tim Barnes was last seen on July 5, 1988, as he was leaving Tenea Lakes near Highway 120, just off Tioga Road in California. Sources differ as to the location he was dropped off at. Some state that it was Tenea Lakes, while others say he was driven to the Murphy Creek Trailhead. Either way, early on the morning of July 5, 1988, Tim said goodbye to whoever had dropped him off with the intention of hiking from Murphy Creek to Polydome Lakes. This is a relatively short three-mile hike with flat and forgiving terrain, It's the perfect trail for a quick hike and the perfect place for the budding outdoorsmen to cut their teeth, so to speak. Having set off early in the morning, it was anticipated that Tim would be back in time for dinner, but unfortunately, he never returned. His friends waited until the morning of July 6, 1988, the next day, to report him missing, in the hopes that their friend had simply gotten lost. As the morning came around and there was no sign of Tim, his friends called the Yosemite National Park Service to report the incident. A wide-scale search of the area was conducted, but there was no sign of Tim. Since that warm July day in 1988, no sign, no trace of Tim has ever been found, and his case is classified as cold. Two years later, Tim was declared deceased in absentia. Tim Barnes is described as a white male with brown hair and brown eyes, stands 6 foot 4 and weighs 180 pounds. According to the Charlie Project, Tim may have a mustache or a goatee. He has blue discoloration on his upper lip and a wart on the right side of his nose. His teeth appear grayish in color, and he has an orthopedic pin implanted in his left ankle. He was last seen wearing a white t-shirt with the letter F and the red circle on it with a slash through it, gray jogging pants, well-worn tennis shoes, sunglasses with brown frames, and was carrying a yellow day pack. At the time of his disappearance, Tim also smoked Marlboro cigarettes. So anyone who may have ran into him on the trail that day or has any information is asked to please contact the Yosemite National Park Police Department at 209-379-1992 and mention case 88-2119. Well, friends, there you have it. What do you think of these strange disappearances? 
I look forward to hearing your comments, but please keep it friendly and respectful. If you'd like to see more videos like this, check out the playlist that we have here on our channel. These playlists showcase our best content and videos that many of you may have never seen before. So check them out, see what you might have missed out. Till we meet again, be good to yourselves and each other. Stay safe out there. As for me, I'll see you a little further on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.